This program is made possible by the members of the Church Street Baptist Church in Greensboro, North Carolina. Coming up this week on Unspeakable Joy with Pastor Tyler Galden. The size of your faith in God will be what sustains you for the long haul. Anybody can get on an altar and lay their children there, and I beg of you to do it. Anybody can get on a marriage, uh, get on an altar and lay their marriage there. But may I remind you tonight that we are not in a sprint, we are in a marathon. It takes somebody with a big heart to wake up every day full of faith and say, God, I'm back on the battlefield this morning. Great God, I'm back on the battlefield for my children. I'm back on the battlefield for my church. I'm back on the battlefield for my nation. And God, I may have had defeat yesterday, but I I'm begging you for victory today. I may have had a mess up yesterday, but I'm believing you for good things today. It takes people with heart to be sober and to be vigilant. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed Thank you for tuning in today. It's our honor to have you on Unspeakable Joy. We're so excited about what we're going to be talking about here in just a minute. But first, I want you to take your Bible and go to 1 Peter chapter number 5. Whether you've got your phone, your Bible, I want to give you these verses out of Peter's epistle. He says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. God began to deal with my heart several weeks ago about being an offensive Christian and not a defensive Christian. Instead of acting after the fact and reacting, acting before. Being offensive, praying before there's a problem, fasting before there's a need. Brothers and sisters, we have a weaponry and we have a victory that's been promised by our captain. I want you to go with me now as we preach the message, Offensive Christianity. Ladies and gentlemen, the Apostle Peter here is talking about exactly what we need to deal with tonight. I am amazed in my own life how defensive in my Christian walk I really am. How many of you know when an attack comes from the enemy? When an attack comes from us on our family, on our marriage, on our children, on our church, on our mind. That's when we get on the altar and start praying. That's when we kneel down in fasting. That's when we give ourselves wholly to that situation. But the Holy Spirit began to deal with my heart the other night about 3 o'clock in the morning. He said, Tyler, what if you had that kind of steadfastness before the attack goes on with the devil? What would happen if you pray for your children with the fervency before their life? lost to the devil as you do after they are lost to the devil. Ladies and gentlemen, it breaks my heart whenever a mother comes up to me, whenever a father comes up to me, and they say, Preacher, would you please pray? My child has gone out in a prodigal way. My marriage is broken up. My husband has left me. My wife has left me. I have lost my job. I cannot help but think in my own heart, and it puts me off of the defensive, and it puts me on the offensive, and I say, Dear God in heaven, help me to have a mind so that I can pray in a way that I don't have to go through the attack and I don't have to go through the battle and I don't have to face the enemy and I don't have to deal with those problems. Brothers and sisters, may I remind you that our dear brother Peter here was talking exactly what that is. He is saying, I am telling you and giving to you things so that you can live in an offensive manner. Can I tell you something tonight? I know they say in basketball and in football, a defense is the best offense and I do understand what they're saying but in the Christian journey I promise you tonight that if the church of Jesus Christ
Christ does not get offensive in the way that we go after the devil, we are never going to see a city one to Christ. We're never going to see our children one to Christ. We're never going to see a church that is revived. You say, preacher, how do you know that? Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 16 and 18? He said, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against them. What are gates there for? Gates are there to keep people on the outside from coming to the inside. And Jesus looked at Peter and he said, big boy, I want to tell you something. I'm going to give you so much power. I'm going to give you so much strength. I'm going to give you so much authority that you're going to be able to march at the devil's gates and attack them and you are going to be able to overcome the devil. And the apostle Peter tonight is going to give to us a threefold cord that we can be all offensive Christians and not defensive. Number one, Peter says this. He says there is an activity that we must be doing. Look there in verse number eight, if you will. He says two things. He says, be sober and be vigilant. Do you know what the word sober means? The word sober is the Greek word. It means the opposite of being intoxicated. It means to be with your mind in the right arena. It means to not be drunk, but to be stagnant. It means to be stable, and it means to handle what is in front of you. I began to ask myself the question the other night. I said, why do people get drunk? They get drunk for one reason. They get drunk to dull the pain of the reality that they are in. So then why would somebody like Peter tell you and I in our spiritual walk, be sober? I'll tell you why. Because we have a desire to get drunk spiritually. Okay, none of you asking any questions. I'll just keep moving on with my thought. You say, preacher, what do you mean we get drunk spiritually? This is what we do spiritually. We do things to dull the pain of the reality that we are in. We don't want to deal with the fact that our husband is going astray. We don't want to deal with the fact that our church is in a mess. We don't want to deal with the fact that we're not praying like we ought to. We don't want to deal with the fact that we're not raising our family. We don't want to deal with the fact that we're not witnessing. We don't want to deal with the fact that our hearts have been broken. We don't want to deal with the fact that there are real issues that need to be accomplished. It's not amazing. We say, oh God, I beg of you, give me comfort from this pain. Give me comfort from this issue. Give me comfort from this problem but the Lord Jesus never promised to give us comfort from the problem he promised to give us comfort in the problem ladies and gentlemen how many times have we gone into a church service and said oh God give me relief from that issue give me relief from that problem and God desires to give you sobriety so that you can deal with the problem ladies and gentlemen we must be sober we must be now what Vigilant. Why must we be sober? Here's why. Because without being sober, you cannot be vigilant. What does the word vigilant mean? It means to keep your bug eyes open so nobody tricks you. That's a redneck definition. You will not find that in Strong's Concordance, but it's just as redneck as I can get. It means keep your eyes open so you don't get messed up. And not just messed up, so that somebody doesn't come and take advantage of you. Apostle Peter said this. He said, you better keep your eyes open like a soldier. You better keep your eyes open like you're on a battlefield. Ladies and gentlemen, can I tell you something? I wish with all of my heart I could live one day where I didn't have to feel like I was fighting the devil. Don't you just wish you could live one day where you didn't feel like you had to be fervent in your praying and you could just sit back? Listen, I'd love not, God in heaven knows I'd love nothing more tonight and I'm just going to be gun barrel straight with you because that's all I know how to be. I wish tonight with all of my heart I could go get in that recliner, click that bad boy up on three, rear back my feet and just turn me on something on the TV and just say boy isn't this a good life have my precious little wife bring me an ice cold coca cola and sit that thing right there beside me and just enjoy the good life but may I remind you tonight I am not able to do that and you are not able to do that do you know why because we are soldiers in a battle and we are fighting the enemy of our soul and the adversary that is coming after us he will get advantage of us he'll take us down you can't give up praying 
praying for your family. Mama, you better not stop praying for those babies. You better not stop praying for this church. Please, God, don't stop praying for me because the moment we stop being sober and stop being vigilant, the adversary is coming after us. There was one thing I watched the other week. It was shocking to me. How many of you have ever seen a cheetah in full sprint? Listen to me. I saw that on the National Geographic. God help if I ever go to Africa and see that in person. Man, all of a sudden that cheetah, it is crouched low. I'm talking low to the ground. I mean that cheetah is down on that ground and it sees that antelope. And man, that antelope is over there looking like a fool just eating its grass. I mean it's just sucking that grass up, drinking that water, doing all that it does. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, like a lightning bolt hit that cheetah. That cheetah shot up and from zero to 60 in just a few seconds. And that cheetah runs and sprints and goes and then it just stops. I thought, what an idiot. You were so close. You're faster than that, that, that antelope. You got more strength than that antelope. Why in the world did you not get that antelope and eat that bad boy for supper? So you know what I did? I got on the National Geographic website. And you know what I learned about a cheetah? A cheetah has a fast start, but due to its small heart, it doesn't run for very long. Ladies and gentlemen, can I tell you tonight, the size of your faith in God will be what sustains you for the long haul. Anybody can get on an altar and lay their children there, and I beg of you to do it. Anybody can get on a marriage, uh, get on an altar and lay their marriage there. But may I remind you tonight that we are not in a sprint, we are in a marathon. It takes somebody with a big heart to wake up every day full of faith and say, God, I'm back on the battlefield this morning. Great God, I'm back on the battlefield for my children. I'm back on the battlefield for my church. I'm back on the battlefield for my nation. And God, I may have had defeat yesterday, but I I'm begging you for victory today. I may have had a mess up yesterday, but I'm believing you for good things today. It takes people with heart to be sober and to be vigilant. There are activities that we're to be doing. You say, preacher, why are we to be vigilant? Can I ask you a question? I get tired. It is wearying to stay in fight mode all the time with the devil. But why are we fighting the devil? One reason. Because the devil, as Jesus told Peter in Luke twenty two thirty one, 31, he said, Peter, Satan hath desired you to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith... Fa Do you know what the devil's after? The devil is after destroying your faith in God. If the devil can get you off kilter and get your youngins and get your family, the first thing that will come into your mind is the devil will tell you, oh yeah, preacher boy, oh yeah, singing man, oh yeah, teaching woman, you did this and you did that, but the devil still, got, yeah, get them up early on Sunday. Bring them back on Sunday night. Look at all that time you spent doing this. Look at all your time you spent doing that. And I still got them, oh yeah. If God loved you, he wouldn't have let me get them. And the devil is out to squash our faith. You know why we have to be vigilant every single day in every single area? Because the devil is out to squash our faith. There is the activity we must be doing. Number two, there is the adversary we are facing. I want you to look there in verse number eight. Watch this. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Ladies and gentlemen, there are three names that Peter gives for the devil right there. He says, first of all, you have an adversary. Number two, the devil. And number three, you have a roaring lion. And Peter there unfolds to us exactly how the enemy comes against us. Number one, as the adversary, he opposes 
us. Do you know what the devil is doing right now before the face of God? He is telling them, you know what? That old boy Jimmy, he's just a low down, good for nothing devil. Uh, you know that he wasn't good. He says, don't you remember Chris? Don't you know what he used to be like? Don't you know? Don't you know what Tyler used to be like? Don't you know what that preacher used to act like? And the whole time the devil is accusing and accusing and accusing and he is opposing and opposing and opposing as our adversary he is there to oppose us ladies and gentlemen can I ask you a question how many of you have ever prayed and you felt like your prayers no got got no higher than that nine foot ceiling in your house have you ever wondered why that is have you ever been in the car listen to me you ever been in the car and I mean you just having you a time with that gospel song you and Peg McCamey are having a spell you're looking to find a place to kick your shoes off in that thing without putting out the windows in your car. I mean, you are absolutely having yourself a time. Life is easy when you're up on the mountain and you've got peace of mind. Boom! You know what you've done? You've run into two lanes over just having yourself a time in that car on I-40. And then all of a sudden, it's like a cloud comes into your car. And all of a sudden, you start thinking about things, and you think, where'd that come from? Where'd that go? You know what that is? That's your adversary opposing you. He's your adversary. Number two, he's the devil. As the devil, he doesn't just oppose us, but he accuses us. He opposes us, and he accuses us. I have a confession to make tonight. I'm a low-down, good-for-nothing, sorry dog. Anybody else like that in the church house tonight? Okay. I'm going to tell you something. I can be at my house trying to study that book, and something comes to me and tells me, the people are leaving. People are going to find out what you are. You know you're not praying like you ought to. You know what you, and I mean, I don't know where this stuff comes from. I feel like my wife's mother's in the, in the room with me. I don't have any idea where it comes from. All of a sudden, I'm thinking, what is that? Is there anybody else in this house tonight that from nowhere, your past is brought, brought right back up in your face and slapped right there in front of you? You know what that is? That's the devil accusing you. He is our adversary, he opposes us. He is the devil, he accuses us, but he's the roaring lion, he threatens us. Do you know what the devil does best to the people of God? He strikes fear into our heart. I'm going to tell you something right now. It doesn't take long living in this nasty world to get afraid of stuff. I'm talking afraid. Afraid you're going to lose your job. Afraid you're going to lose your marriage. Afraid you're going to lose your mind. Afraid you're going to lose your praying ability. Afraid you're going to lose this. Afraid you're going to lose that. And I mean, before you know it, I, the other day, I was in my little study. I was trying to pray. I was dealing with the opposition in my mind. I was dealing with the accusing in my soul. And all of a sudden, it was as if the devil swept into my, into my mind. And he said, get ready, big boy. This coming Sunday, 150 people are leaving you. And before I knew it, such fear, like claws, had latched onto my heart. I'll be at revival meetings, sleeping in these hotel rooms, two o'clock in the morning. Nothing on, just me and my thoughts. And I'll hear whispers in the night to try to shriek panic. You remember when Paul told uh, Timothy, but God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Why would he have to say that? Because there would be a spirit that would try to overwhelm us with fear. So there are the actions we must be doing, the adversary we are to be facing. Number three, let me give this to you right quickly. There is the advantage we have. Now this is the juicy part of the message. Let me give this out there, throw it to you, lay it down, you study it when you get home, all right? The apostle here gives to us some advantages that we have. He begins in verse number nine. He says this, though in verse number eight he says, you have an adversary, the devil, he's a roaring lion, seeking who may devour. Verse number nine, whom resist 
steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Number one, our first advantage that we have, we have the advantage of resisting. Ladies and gentlemen, you know what you need to do whenever temptation comes your way? You flee temptation, but when it comes to the devil, that line, we are to resist the devil. You say, preacher, what do you mean? Well, there was a man named Malcolm Collins. He was a missionary to Africa. And Mr. Collins, he gave a, a, a little children's lesson on a Sunday morning at a church. He went into that church and there was these little children. And they sat right there and he sat up on the, on the platform. He said, I want to tell you how to survive a lion attack. Those children said, okay. He said, there's three things you do to survive a lion attack. Number one, if you see a lion out in the distance... Do not run. He said, stand your ground. He said, because the moment that that lion senses fear, he is going to come after you. He said, and if you try to run, he will outrun you. He said, the second thing you do is you begin to face him and walk toward him. He said, because I promise you, if you stand there long enough, he's going to realize you're not nearly as big as you think you are, and he's coming after you. He said, but here's what you need to do. He said, you make sure as you start walking, bow your chest up, broad your shoulders back, and start walking at that enemy. He said, but this is the third thing you need to do, and it may come to this. He said, if you get up and you walk, start walking, he said, get your spear out, because you may have to get into a fight with that thing, and as it leaps upon you... You make sure you stick that spear up under it and it will land on top of that spear. Brothers and sisters, tonight, may I remind you, God hath not given us the spirit of fear. We do not have to run from the devil. He's got no power over us. He has no strength over us. He has nothing that he can't have. He has nothing that we can't be. You say, preacher, what do you do? I'll tell you what you do. You stand up in the righteousness of Christ. You face him as the Son of God faced him with the Word of God and you take that sword in your hand and when the devil comes in, you, you stick that sword up under him and you tell him, devil, I am found in the righteousness of Christ. I am the son of the living God and you can't beat me. You've already been defeated. You've already been hammered and stick that bad boy up under him. And when he gets ready to run on top of you and snarl you up, honey, the living word of God will stick him and pierce him right through the heart and the devil will die dead at your feet right there all because you resisted him. There's the second thing. We resist him Number two, there is the advantage of recognition. Look at verse number nine. Can I help you with something right quick? Here's what it says. Resist steadfast in the faith. Watch this phrase. Knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Why would that be an encouragement to the people? Here's why. If I'm going through something... And Bob's going through the same thing. And Jacob's going through the same thing. And Claude's going through the same thing. Now, if I'm over here by myself, are you with me? I'm over here by myself. If I'm going through it all by my lonesome, there's a part of you that says, God, what did I do wrong? Where did I mess up? But all of a sudden over here, if Bob's going through it, Jacob's going through it, and Claude's going through it, Jamie's going through it, and I'm going through it. Now I look at it, and I say this. I say, dear God in heaven, I'm not being rejected by God. I'm being rejected by the devil because I've been accepted by God, and it brings comfort to your heart. You say, preacher, why am I going through such adversarial things? Why am I going through such th problems? I'll tell you why. Because you've been found in the hand of God, and the devil hates everything in the hand of God. He hates everything that God loves. And if you are going through trials and persecutions and pains, you better mark it down. The devil hates your guts. But the devil only hates what God loves. And if the devil hates you, there's a big old God up in heaven that's saying, I sure do love you, honey. I sure am proud of God in heaven. I sure am proud of you, youngin. You sure make me happy. You sure make me smile. Can I tell you something? 
I know that the devil's fighting many of you. I know there's a mind game going on with so many of you and you don't know what to do. Your homes are being ripped apart. Your families are being ripped apart. But I remind you, you stand fast in the faith. You stand firm in Christ Jesus. You don't go back on the devil. You resist him and you recognize the fact that the devil only fights what he fears. And if God fights you, that if the devil fights you, he must fear you. But then there's a third thing. And this is what I close with tonight. There is the advantage of relief. Look at what verse 10 says. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto His eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Brothers and sisters, listen to me. We have a tonic, a remedy to trials and persecutions and suffering. It's called the grace of God. But watch this. Look at your scripture. It does not say God will give you grace. It says the God of grace will do this. How many of you have had, have had or have teenagers or little children? You've got children of some sort. I've got children... I've got two, two little ones, and my youngest one is scared out of her wits over dogs. She, she, she doesn't like, she doesn't want to be around dogs, she doesn't want to be around, she doesn't want to touch them. We come to your house and there's a dog, she's climbing up daddy on top of, her, on top of my head like a tunic. I mean, scared to death. The other week, we were at my grandmother's house and... We were kindly sitting on the side porch and all of a sudden I heard a shrill, a scream come from the back, back here in the, where the playground stuff was. She screamed, Daddy! I jumped up out of my chair. I hit three steps as I went to that backyard. And there was a dog barking behind the fence in the neighbor's yard. She's three. She doesn't understand that that fence has kept that dog from her. All she knows is that there's an enemy that's barking and scaring her to death. You know what daddy did? Daddy went running to his child that had called his name. I tell you tonight, child of God, your cries have awoken your master. When you cry in the midnight hour and say, God, I'm afraid. God, I'm petrified. God, the devil's tearing my family apart. God, the devil's tearing my mind apart. The devil's tearing my life apart. The devil's tearing me apart. I'll tell you what God Almighty does. He dispatches the third person of the Trinity, the sweet Holy Ghost of God that resides in your heart. And just as you run after your child when a bully's after him, how much so does your Father which is in heaven go down to where the enemy is attacking you and say, devil, get back on your side of the offense. This is my child. You can't touch my child. Don't get near my child. I tell you tonight, child of God, keep your head up high. Keep your faith filled. Get your heart right. You say, preacher, I feel like I'm going to throw in the towel. Don't throw in the towel. There's a great big God in heaven that loves you. There's a great big God in heaven that's not going to give up on you. And we are on the winning side. We're the victors. We're in the bottom of the fourth. We're at the end of the fourth quarter, at the bottom of the ninth. And we've got two outs. We're winning the ball game. All we've got to do is not give up. You know the devil can't beat you in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The only way the devil can destroy you and beat you is for you to forfeit in the fight. So I say get back in the fight. Throw in back in with God. Get your sword back out and say, God, I'm ready to fight. I'm ready to pray. I'm ready to fast. I'm ready to do what I got to do. And come hell, come high water, no matter what, I will trust and serve the living God.